and thank you for coming. Um, I run a um, risk analysis bureau, global, uh, global Risk Insights, and I'd like to take you through um, three major trends that we see in political risk and also n some new trends in how Treasury sh should deal with them. Now, surveys of business executives' uh, outlook lists political risks as one of the most pressing concerns. Um, the Association of Financial Professionals, uh, their surveys have shown that respondents feel uncertainty, and especially political uncertainty, has become the new normal. Yet, very few actually measure political risks, according to Accenture, and fewer still have incorporated political risks into their enterprise risk management or treasury risk, although that number is growing. Companies choose simply either to accept these risks or to avoid opportunities altogether if the risk is too high. Yet proper political risk management offers a competitive advantage, as many of you will know. And in many cases, those risks might be forced onto your treasury anyway when the crisis hits, hits the risk averse. So the world tour, it's uh, quite um, the feat given current political conditions. Uh, but I will trace these major trends uh, and offer some thoughts on how to deal with them. The first is on everyone's mind, uh, China. And their acute financial difficulties have been long in the making and politics are really behind them. There's still a highly domestic focus to reforms and that includes those that are labeled international reforms like internationalization of the renminbi um, and capital controls. They have a market-based goal, but authorities will not sacrifice political or social stability for those goals. That means that several reforms will either not be implemented or delayed if it has the added purpose of keeping the population happy. That was the case with the stock market bubble we just saw, where market trading, uh, margin trading sorry, was allowed early on and then put on halt again in May, which basically pricked the bubble. That's also the case with most financial reforms and state owned enterprise reforms. Still, there's a potential for reversion of current trends and that the pace of reform slows quickly, as we saw in the mid-2000s. One thing has become clear after this summer, though. Chinese policymakers are just human beings. They're not the demigods that markets had them made out to be. And indeed, policymaking in China seems opaque and uncoordinated because it sometimes is. Top leading small groups set broad parameters for reforms, which agencies like the People's Bank of China, like the Securities Commission, then scramble to fill with meaning. Sometimes that's coordinated like it was with the stock market interventions, although that was somewhat unsuccessful. Sometimes it's not like the People's Bank of China's recent devaluation in light of the broader parameters of the Chinese economy. Now the difficulty for China is exactly the opacity in the, these decision-making processes. It leads the outside world to speculate on motivations to no one's benefit, even when reforms are made with the best intentions and often with the best results. As you know, these effects reverberate around the world in currency, in commodities markets, and exporters. We should expect more volatility across asset types that are connected to the Chinese market and especially to Chinese policies partly from the deliberate attempt of market-based reforms and partly from the knee-jerk reactions in markets due to this OPEC decision-making. The second trend I want to highlight is that the EC money environment is starting to wane off. The ECB and the Bank of Japan may still give it one last push before normalization, but the Fed is clearly moving in one direction and it's just a matter of timing. Coupled with growth concerns, this has profound implications for political risks to treasuries across the world. Emerging markets are looking more vulnerable than they have for a long time, and politics, national politics especially, is stepping in to protect th their economies from high capital outflows and the consequent exchange rate fluctuations as we see here. Loose monetary policies in major economies meant that the rules of the monetary trilemma could be bent. Soon that is no longer so. Emerging markets will have difficulty in tapping debt markets, and we will have quite some way down to go in terms of capital outflows. That puts structure, structural reform at the forefront, but national politics and scandal, scandals play a huge role 
in these dynamics, as we've seen in Russia, in Brazil, in Malaysia. And we are likely to see protective measures in exchange rates and or capital flows rather than significant structural reform. Moreover, the investor faith that was generated during these relaxed monetary conditions is waning, and speculation against politics, as we've just seen in the Chinese stock market, is now moving from stocks to commodities futures and on, which in large part exacerbates the volatility beyond fundamentals. The final trend I want to emphasize is what we might, or what some have called weaponized finance. I'd rather call it strategic or political use of finance. And I'll give you three examples. The first is that sanctions are still a preferred policy tool of choice in international politics. The use of financial restrictions targeting in smart ways has grown. This preference does not seem to go away, despite the Iran agreement and so on. And it can severely affect debt refinancing, foreign investments, and foreign exchange exposure of treasuries. The political use of financial power is increasing, also in financially safer parts of the world, as we've seen in Europe and Russia. The second element is that with this more volatile global economic environment, states are increasingly looking inwards. This means preferential treatment is growing again through trade and investment agreements. Governments exercise greater control over strategic sectors, and the decade-long policy autonomy of many multinationals is waning. For one part, this, is, this means uh, a legitimate regulatory enforcement such as EU competition rules. But in large part, it also means that interests and political stability in emerging markets that I mentioned before plays a larger role. Now, thirdly, this does not mean that multi multilateral economic cooperation doesn't grow. Several countries have started using multilateral institutions as a tool for political or strategic investments and competition with existing international infrastructure. This is, for instance, evident with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and BRICS collaboration on investment vehicles. It offers new opportunities, but also new risks as countries compete for economic influence and restrict that of others. Now, I could name many more, but in the interest of time, I'll leave that to uh, discussions afterwards. But I, I was asked to say a little bit about what treasuries can do. Models of risk management have traditionally used some variation of these steps. Once political risk exposure is identified, usually by either imagining scenarios or doing broader exposure analysis, the impact is measured using discounted cash flows, network analysis, and so on, and then managed through a variety of ways, hedging, insurance, diversification, and so on. Now, these methods assume that risks, and especially political and financial risks, can be predicted following standard methods of measurements. And that that allows for the management of very specific risks. That is often not the case, as we measure risks on the basis of past performance, making us vulnerable to unpredictable shocks. Most major political events that turn into financial shocks look predictable after the fact because our data falls into place. Yet historical data is no guarantee for the future. So I want to point you to a new trend in risk management. And that is that many risks that treasuries fa face are fat-tailed in their distribution. It means they have unbounded variance for the statistici statisticians among you. Um, but more specifically, it means that their effects are non-linear. Um, they interact in ways that are highly unpredictable. Um, especially in politics and finance. To, to give you an example, one shock, say an exchange rate change, has a certain effect, but a second similar change has disproportionately larger effects. Debt is a case in point. A non, it has a nonlinear relation to rate exchange events and often interacts with a host of other variables. So $10 billion in debt is not just 10 times riskier to hold than $1 billion in debt. It, it's exponentially more risky, especially if it interacts with other variables like currency changes and political re and regulatory changes and so on. 
Nassim Taleb has called this the Turkey problem, essentially that risk management follows trend, past trends of the butcher feeding us an, a sufficient amount of civil, similar events until that leads to one big unpredictable event and the turkey's head is caught off. A growing field in political risk management therefore talks about fragility instead. It's measurable, but it's non-predictive. So exposure identification is still required, but measurement and management look very differently, and I'll get to those in a second. But put another way, sensitivity to volatility can be measured. Risks often cannot. So instead of trying to predict specific events and measure and manage them, this turns focus to the entity at risk and sets up systems for continuous shock testing of your treasury, of your cash management systems. And it also creates the agility to move with change. This idea of resilience to external shocks rests on the acceptance of some volatility. You have to accept some volatile movement, at least from a risk-averse model, to make use of it. But it comes with the added benefit of being agile enough in your treasury structure to deal with major disruptive change. Think of your treasury structure as letting off steam by using buffers, say for instance in liquidity. Now, a few companies have yet tried this, but it is highly applicable, I'd argue, to company treasuries. Those with significant exposure to unpredictable or volatile risks, for instance in commodities or currencies, have started to make operations more agile, for instance by using short-term trades and hedging, that can make use of price and rate changes instantly, for instance, in raw materials. The digitization and automation of cash management also allows for stress testing models that can spot these vulnerabilities, while continuous monitoring gives you real-time data needed for making decisions. It requires you still to identify exposures by calculating a baseline scenario for your treasury operations from risk from which risks and opportunities make you deviate. And I know that is still difficult and requires strategic decisions about where the company is moving. But more than make, making this, the treasury resilient, it may actually allow you to take advantage of risks and opportunities and thrive on this volatility that I've described. That's all for now. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Emil.